Welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. It's so great to be with you today. I hope you're as excited as I am for what the Lord has laid on my heart to share as part of our series through the book of Revelation. Uh, before we get to the sermon, however, just a couple things to let you know about. Uh, ladies, you can still sign up for Women's Retreat. This is your last day to do so. I really encourage you, if this is something that you can make it to, please consider doing it. Uh, if finances are a barrier for you, make sure to contact the women's team as they do have some uh, help, some uh, various plans available if that's something that you need to make use of. Uh, but definitely make retreat a priority this year. I can say after having just been to the men's retreat myself, after a couple years off, there was a real opening of the floodgates and, and it'll be very worth your while to go there. Uh, if you have kids looking to get uh, into some church activities this summer, we have our VBS in July, which registration for that is open now. We also have Kids Camp coming up at the end of August, uh, and the registration for that is open. All of these registrations, by the way, you can find on our website. Uh, you can also sign up for VBS to be a volunteer. We are going to need a great team of volunteers to run this uh, to make sure that our kids and the kids from our community are blessed this summer. So with that, I hope you're ready. I hope you're excited because church starts now. Well, I'm so excited to be continuing our series through the book of Revelation, and I hope that you are enjoying it uh, as much as I am. Preparing this message has been a blast. There's just so much uh, in this book, and of course, we're only focusing on the first three chapters, because honestly, to do a series through the whole book of Revelation, I have to imagine it would take a year, if not more. Um, but in my interactions with Revelation, I have come to the conclusion that out of all the books of the Bible, and certainly the books of the New Testament, this book requires an inordinate amount of humility when we come to it. <clears throat> In general, we should come to God's Word with a humble heart, but when we're coming to the book of Revelation, just so much, we need to be able to put pride aside come in humbly, uh, the image being of a, a child approaching a teacher. Let's see what the Spirit is going to teach us from the pages of the Bible today, because if we go into the book of Revelation with even an ounce of pride, we're going to guarantee ourselves a bad reading. We cannot go into this thinking like, oh yeah, I know all the answers, or you know, I'm going to be the one to figure out the date of the second coming, or what all the images mean, and, and perfectly apply them. We have to come in saying, I know nothing. Jesus, teach me something. So before we get into the text today, I want us to just pray that way, praying that God would give us humble hearts as we approach his word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and that you have given us such an amazing book uh, in the Bible to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, to guide us, Lord, and to encourage us. Lord, would we be encouraged today as we enter into your word? And above all, Lord, would you strip away our pride? Strip away our pretenses, what we think we know, what we may have already heard from these passages, and just help us to hear from you. Lord, as the one speaking, I pray that you would cut away my opinion, cut away what I have to say and what I think, and instead just speak through me so that we can all learn something of who you are and what you want from us today. We ask this and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned, I'm very excited about the book of Revelation. I love it quite a bit. I, I'm a very visual person, so all the imagery present here is just, it's food for my mind. And, and, and I love to picture it. I love to read these passages out loud to myself when I come here in my devotions, because I find that the imagery works really well when I'm speaking it. Um, and I, I feel a little bit tied to the book of Revelation, because I have actually visited the island of Patmos in Greece. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's a gorgeous island. It's like rolling sheep pastures. It's really small, and there's this like one hill that's sort of the highest. And when you go up on top, you can see the Aegean Sea spread out on all sides. It's just beautiful. And I probably shouldn't have gone there because now I have a really hard time empathizing with uh, John's imprisonment on this island. I'm like, how do I get exiled on a Greek island? What's the rent situation like there? But uh, no, I did visit and it was and it was great. And they have actually a, a place that you can go called the Cave of the Apocalypse, which is where John wrote the book of Revelation. 
But on the day that I went there, it was closed. Uh, and I was like, I'm not coming all the way to the island of Patmos not to go to the cave of the Revelation. So uh, I hopped the fence uh, and I broke into the apocalypse. I, I'm pretty sure that's a sin. So the, consider this my confession to you. Uh, but yeah, it was it was neat to be able to be in that spot. During that same trip, I was also able to visit the ruins of the city of Ephesus, which last week, Pastor Danny unpacked uh, the letter to Ephesus as it's present in in this book in um, chapter two. And then today we're going to be visiting a city nearby, which is the city of Sardis. It's just over the mountains from Ephesus, uh, and it's got very unique um, and yet relatable issues going on in that church. And Jesus is kind of calling these things out in, in this letter. We're going to see what he says to this church. Uh, not to be confused, by the way, with Sardis in Chilliwack, although both are very similar cities. They're kind of nestled in the arms of the mountains, but near a river plain. So they've got lots of farm area kind of spread out. Uh, but anyway, next time you're in Sardis in Chilliwack, you can think, hey, I know the namesake of this, and it's the city of Sardis in modern-day Turkey. So let's turn and see what Jesus is saying to the church in Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 to 6. It says, To the angel of the church of Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches." So right away, we are smacked in the face by imagery, just so much imagery. You have the seven stars, which we've now talked about two weeks in a row. Uh, seven is the number meaning completeness, wholeness, fullness. Uh, so seven stars meaning all the stars. It's Jesus holding the universe in his hand. And then you've got the seven spirits of God. Don't worry. There is only one Holy Spirit. This isn't some sort of deep Christian lore where I'm going to tell you about the, you know, the other seven members of the Trinity. Trinity's three, and we're, we're cutting off it there. It just means, again, completeness, fullness. So seven spirits of God being the fullness of the Holy Spirit is with Jesus as he's saying these things and as he's proclaiming this to the church. We see the image of him coming like a thief, not new imagery. We've seen that in the book of Matthew as well. And he talks about coming like a thief. It's an image of quickness and of suddenness with no warning uh, that he's going to appear. They won't know the time. In Matthew, he's talking about his second coming. But here, he's talking about coming as a thief to the church of Sardis in judgment of their deeds. And, and if they aren't going to listen to his words and turn from their ways then the, the time is coming and they won't know when, so they need to act now to strengthen what is uh, dying in their church. They are ambassadors. We are all ambassadors of Jesus, and Jesus doesn't want ambassadors out there that are going to besmirch his name. So he's like, I'm going to come like a thief if you don't take care of these things. In all of these letters, there's a pattern that's present. There's uh, a starting time where we have sort of the commendation or the rebuke of Jesus. He talks about what he knows about the church, the good things they're doing, the bad things they're doing. We move into an exhortation where Jesus tells them how to fix what's wrong or what they should be doing. And then finally into a promise, something where it says to the one who is victorious. And Jesus talks about, you know, if you are faithful to do as I've asked, there is reward here. There is blessing here. So let's look at the opening to the church in Sardis. And we see um, some very, very strong language right off the hop. It says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. 
They have a living reputation, but a dead reality. They really are just the walking dead, wandering around with no power, no passion, no spirit. Interestingly enough, this is different than the other six churches that get letters because there is no commendation. There is no good thing lift listed here. There's also no mention of false doctrine. There's no mention of false teachers, false teaching. There's no mention of hardship, of oppression. And in, like most interestingly, there's zero mention of persecution of any kind. So this is giving us an insight into this church, what they're going through and, and what it's like. And unfortunately, the image that we see is one that's just like the world around them. They're not being persecuted. They're not experiencing false teaching. They're not being attacked from inside and outside like the other churches are. Why? Because just like the non-Christians in their city, they are spiritually dead. They're just doing nothing. They're nice. They're a nice church. They have a great reputation with their community. The people of Sardis like them. Uh, but that's a problem because that is showing us that they aren't pushing any boundaries. They aren't taking any ground from the enemy. They are not doing the things that a church should be doing. My commentary said this. It says, the unsaved people in Sardis saw the church as a respectable group of people who were neither dangerous nor desirable. They were decent people with a dying witness and a decaying ministry. The church in Sardis cared more about their reputation than with actually doing what Jesus wanted them to do. And as a result, they are spiritually dead. That's the language that the Bible uses to refer to those who have not accepted Jesus, who have not been brought to life spiritually by the Holy Spirit. That there's this spiritual deadness present in this church. And we can see this language has been used before for the Pharisees when Jesus is taking them on in the book of Matthew. Turn with me to Matthew 23. We're going to read verses 27 and 28. Jesus says this. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. There's no neutrality here. There is no middle ground, half alive, half dead. You're either alive or dead spiritually. And this church, Jesus is calling out, you are dead spiritually Outside, you look great. Your reputation, stellar. People love it. You have a reputation for being alive, but how false a reputation it is for on the inside, all I see are bones and wickedness. Jesus is calling them out for this. And furthermore, he says that their works are unfinished. It says, I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. So they have the deeds. There are deeds. I mean, the whole thing starts with him saying, I know your deeds. So they are doing things. This church isn't doing nothing. They're doing many things. And yet, those deeds are lacking something. They're unfinished. They're missing something. And that something is the power and the life of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus shouts at them, wake up! Shake off that apathy, that spiritual deadness. Your deeds need life in them. You're praying, but without any conviction. You're reading the word, but you're not understanding it. You're giving, but not sacrificially. You're serving your community, but it's to build up your own reputation, not to glorify God. There's no life in the things that you're doing. Another comment from my commentary says that all of the church's man-made programs can never bring life any more than a circus can resurrect the dead. The, the programs that we put forward as a church, and I mean this for Sunshine Hills Church, for Sardis Church, for any church in between, the programs we put forward must be empowered by the Holy Spirit or they mean nothing. We can be here on this hill 
We can put out the best Sunday morning service you've ever been a part of with the, the top tier musicians and the best speakers. And we can have a kids ministry that's vibrant and bright and has all the colors and all the songs and a youth ministry, a student ministry for the preteens and the teenagers that's amazing and they play great games and a full men's retreat and a gene event. And if it isn't powered by the Holy Spirit, if it isn't focused on the Holy Spirit and on what Jesus wants, It's all worthless. It's dead. It's deeds that come to nothing. We have to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, as the Bible says, and listen to the warning here. Because spiritual deadness can come upon any of us and any church. We are not immune to this. And this warning is for Sardis, but it's also for all churches for all time to wake up and strengthen what remains. So how does Jesus counsel them to fix this problem? Because he hasn't given up on them. And that's an encouragement to us that even in the midst of this spiritual deadness, Jesus cares enough to bring a revelation to John so that he can send letters to them, calling them to repent and to return to what they need to be doing. And Jesus says, he says, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Not everything is dead in this church yet. They still have some of that power, that passion, that spirituality, but it's on the edge. It's about to die. They need to do something about it. And so he says three things that they're to do. They need to remember, they need to hold fast, and they need to repent. First of all, they need to remember. It says remember what you have received and heard. Now, this line in Greek is incredibly rich, and the word that we translate as just what is actually a very round word, and it means both what and how. It's quantity and quality. It's method and the meat. What you've received. Remember what you've received, and remember how it came upon you, how you received it. And, of course, what he's talking about here is the power and the goodness of the Holy Spirit. The church in Sardis was remembering what to do. They were doers. They were good at doing. They had a great reputation for it. But they had forgotten what they had received. The whole purpose of the doing, the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus, and and how it came upon them. I think about the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit coming in power upon the believers, tongues of fire and a fresh wind of God. They have forgotten all of that. And it has caused their spirituality to decline. Second, they are told to hold fast. Now, this word means to obey, to follow after, to cling to. Uh, Remembering is good, and it's the first step, but it's nothing without the obedience that comes. Remembering that Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit and then being faithful to follow the prompting and the guiding of the Holy Spirit as he leads our churches, as he leads our ministries, as he leads our personal lives. Obeying, holding fast. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Paul writes, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted And built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. We can't just settle for remembering what we've received. We have to be obedient to live the life walking with Jesus. We have to walk with Jesus now so that we will walk with him later, robed in white, just like Revelation says. And then finally, there's the call to repent. Again, this is not new. This is not unique to the book of Revelation. This is all throughout Scripture. Repent. Turn away. This was present in the letter to Ephesus. Danny Jones talked about it last week. The turning away 180 degrees. Taking those things that are wicked, that aren't of God, and removing ourselves. Going in a new direction towards Jesus. Walking with him and towards him. We will have times where instead of remembering, we forget. Instead of holding fast, we let go. That happens. Repentance is the essential ingredient here. That as we go through life and we make mistakes, we are faithful to come to the Lord and repent, turning away from our wickedness, our apathy, our worldliness, 
and allowing him to cleanse us, to wash us in his blood, to forgive us, to remove those blemishes. Those blemishes are brought out in the text as well. It says that you have some in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. And the word here is soiled, not stained. Those are two distinct words, and it was on purpose that John chose this word or was instructed to to write this word, I should say, that they have not soiled their clothes because the implication is that the stains are permanent. But a soiling, it's just mud. It's just, you know, you've got some dirt on you, and you can wash it off. It can be cleaned. And so the, the challenge to the church in Sardis is that you have these people who are not being cleaned. They're getting dirty, which happens. The world is a dirty place. It's full of mud. (laughs) It's full of sin. It's full of temptation. We're going to fall. We're going to scuff up our white clothes. But if we're not returning to Jesus in repentance, remembering, holding fast, and repenting, then instead of us being washed when we get our white robes soiled, it will accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. The image that comes to my mind is when my family, we used to take our dog down to the Fraser River to play. And she was a brown dog, chocolate lab, and beautiful brown sort of uh, chestnut fur. And uh, she would play in that mud at the banks of the Fraser River. And it's, you know, the Fraser River mud, it's that sort of gray, dull color. And she'd run up and down the beach, and as she was running through the the shallow water, she'd be kicking up mud like crazy, and she'd roll in it, and she'd swim in it. And after a while, she would be completely coated in the mud. And eventually, we did not have a brown dog. We had a gray dog. And she could, and often did, just lie down somewhere in the mud, and we wouldn't even be able to see her because she would blend in so much. The Christians in the church of Sardis have failed to come forward to Jesus for cleansing. And so they have gotten some of that worldliness, some of that apathy, some of that spiritual deadness on them. And it has accumulated and accumulated and accumulated to the point now where they are camouflaged with the city around them. Believer and unbeliever, indistinguishable. And where Jesus has called them has called us to have white robes that show our separateness, that we are his holy people, that he has called us out, that we are different because we're walking in his light. Instead, the church of Sardis has become satisfied with living on yesterday's reputation when today's church is meaningless and devoid of strength and power. It's interesting to note that this warning is for the whole church. And yet, though the letter begins with the warning to the whole church, we come down to this moment where it says you have a few people, a remnant of people, who have not soiled their clothes. And then, coming forward into the promise at the end of the letter, it says the one who is victorious. So the warning is for the whole church, but the promise is for the individual. And this is uh, a clue for us on how to walk this out. Because I don't want Sunshine Hills Church to be like this church at this time. And I think that you'd probably agree with me on that front. We want spiritual life. We want power. We want the Holy Spirit to be present in everything we do. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that our church is a church of life instead of a church that's called out for being dead? Well, even though the warning is for the church, the work is individual. We all have to do the work of being alive ourselves, of remembering, of holding fast, and of repenting. Because if each of us is faithful to get our white robes washed, then we will be a church that is alive. But the temptation here, and this is often the temptation, is to look at and care about our brothers' and our sisters' robes instead of cleaning the muck off of our own. Jesus has a lot to say on this front as well. In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, this is a very well-worn passage. Verse 3 to 5 says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye 
when all of the time there is a plank in your own. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Let's not look around and try and judge who else's robes are dirty. Let's look at our own. Because if we want a church that's alive, we have to be Christians who are alive. And the only person that can work on that is us in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. You cannot wash somebody else. That's not your job. That's not my job. We can strengthen each other. We can encourage each other. But we first have to make sure that we are walking in repentance and in obedience with Christ. I love the promises present in all of this text. I love that no matter what Jesus says to these churches, no matter how much rebuke, correction, and exhortation is present, it always ends with a very hopeful promise. The one who is victorious will, like them, be robed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. I don't know about you, but I want to be the one who is victorious. I want to do well. I want to win this for Jesus. I want to do what he's asking of me. And I know that it's hard to remember, to hold fast, to repent. It's not an easy process or we'd all be doing it all the time. But it's one that's worth working towards. And I want this for Sunshine Hills Church. I want to be clear. I don't think that we are a spiritually dead church. I don't think we are. In fact, I've seen so much spiritual life in this church, especially since we started to really come back together after a very difficult season. I'm seeing new life like never before, and it's beautiful, and I'm I'm so excited for what God's going to do next. But we would be fools to ignore the warning that's present here, because just because this isn't us today doesn't mean that it never will be or never can be. And I, for one, would love for us, all of us, myself included, to be vigilant against spiritual deadness long before we start receiving letters from people exiled on islands. And so the question is for us today, if we don't want to be like this, will we remember what we've received? Will we remember what we've received? Will we keep in mind what the Holy Spirit has done for our church, the miracles that he's worked in this congregation, the words of encouragement he's spoken to us through worship, through sermons, through prophecy? Will we remember what we have received? Will we hold fast to what Jesus is is telling us, commanding us, to his teachings, to good doctrine, Will we read our Bibles? Will we speak about our faith with one another to make sure that we're encouraging one another and holding one another up? And will we repent? Will we repent? Will we be faithful and humble enough to come to him when our garments get soiled and to say, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, forgive me, because I want to walk in righteousness. I want to be victorious. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for this time together, for this encouragement from your word, because that truly is what you're doing. You are encouraging us. And although it can be a hard word, although this can be a hard book, we know that your heart is always for us, Lord, that you desire for Sunshine Hills Church to be successful in shining your light in this community. You desire for each individual believer in this congregation to see victory, over the temptations, over the, uh, the ways of this world in our own lives. So Lord, we just come to you in humility. We ask that you would uh, reach in and bring us to life spiritually. Show us those areas that we need to strengthen lest they die. Lord, show us those things where we have forgotten what we've received and how we received it. Show us where we're not holding fast to everything that you've spoken. And Lord, we repent. We repent of the times that we have failed to come to you, failed to walk after you, failed to remember you in our day-to-day lives, in our spiritual lives, in our workplaces, in our families. Lord, we want to keep you front and center. We ask that you would bless us as we endeavor to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you're watching today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, but you would like to. 
to the one who is victorious. He will not blot your name out from the book of life. You can have eternal life. You can spend eternity in heaven with him, and it's as easy as just asking him to, to save you, to be your Lord. So just by praying along with me, you can ask him into your life that way. Lord, I give you my all. I give you my everything. I ask that you would rescue me, God, forgive me of my sins, and be my Lord. Guide me, lead me. I give you my everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I want to just celebrate with you. And please let somebody know. You can call us at the church office, but I encourage you, tell a friend, uh, tell someone you love, because that's an amazing decision to make. And hey, for everyone out there, if this is something that you're struggling with, and I mean this for anything we're going to talk about during this series, because there's a lot of very challenging pieces in these verses that call out some different things. And if at any point you're like, I'm wrestling with this, I need help, I need someone to pray with me, we here at the church, we're always available. So we would love to hear from you. You can send me a message, you can email me, call me, call the church office. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to talk to you about these things. Because really, this is what it's about as a church. So I hope that you have a great rest of your week. Be blessed. Bye.